In this lesson, we're going to go over a few things. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to practice um, integration since we're getting more comfortable with the fundamental theorem of calculus. We're going to also go over something called the net change theorem. And the last topic we're going to talk about is integrating even functions versus odd functions. It's a nice little trick that we can use uh, to help us take shortcuts when integrating even and odd functions. So first, let's practice a couple of examples of using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, we are going to use the power rule in this example to integrate the function the square root of t times 1 plus t. Now, whenever you have a function like this, I highly recommend that if you can, you simplify first before integrating because it makes the integration a lot easier. So first, let's rewrite the square root of t as t to the 1 half. And then we can distribute the t to the 1 half. So t to the 1 half times 1 is t to the 1 half. And then when I take t to the 1 half times t, I have like bases. And when I multiply, I add my exponents. So I'm going to have 1 half plus 1 for the exponent of t. And that's going to give me t to the 3 halves. Now, when the function is in this form, it's much easier to use the power rule. So now that we have it simplified, I'm going to go ahead and start the integration. So I'm going to integrate and find the antiderivative of each of these terms. So if I find the antiderivative of t to the 1 half, that means I have to add 1 to 1 half, which gives me 3 halves and then divide by 3 halves. When I find the antiderivative of t to the 3 halves, I'm going to add 1 to the 3 halves. So that gives me t to the 5 halves. And then I have to divide by that exponent. Now at this point, I can add in the plus c. But because I know later on when we subtract and evaluate it on the interval from one, from 1 to 4, I know those c's are going to disappear. So I'm not going to bother adding that in there. You can if you want, but I'm not going to. So we still need to evaluate this on the interval from 1 to 4, but I want to finish simplifying first. I have a fraction divided by a fraction, so I'm going to do a flip and multiply and rewrite this as 2 thirds t to the 3 halves. Plus, and I'm going to do the same thing with the 5 halves, flip and multiply, so I get 2 fifths t to the 5 halves, and I'm going to evaluate that from 1 to 4. Now remember when you're evaluating, it's important to evaluate it at 4 first, and then subtract whatever you get when you evaluate it at 1. So when I plug in 4 first, I'm going to get 2 thirds, 4 to the 3 halves plus 2 fifths times 4 to the 5 halves. So that's my big F of 4. Now I'm going to subtract my big F of 1. So I have 2 thirds, 1 to the 3 halves plus 2 fifths, 1 to the 5 halves. Now, when I simplify all of this, my final answer is going to be 256 over 15. The next example, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to practice integrating. And we need to integrate the function x squared minus 3x over the interval 1 to 3. So I'm going to set up my integral on the interval from 1 to 3. I'm going to have x squared minus 3x, and my variable of integration is going to be x. Now, there really isn't anything I need to do to simplify this, so I can go directly into finding my antiderivative for each of the terms. So I'm going to add 1 to my exponent of 2, and I'll get 3, and then I divide by 3. 
For the next term, 3x, I'm going to add 1 to the exponent and divide by that exponent. And I need to evaluate that from 1 to 3. So first I need to find my big F of 3, and then I'm going to subtract my big F of 1. So when I plug in 3, I get 3 cubed over 3 minus 3 times 3 squared over 2. That's my big F of 3. Now I'm going to plug in 1. So I have 1 to the third over 3 minus 3 times 1 squared over 2. When I clean that up, I'm going to get a final answer of negative 10 thirds. Okay, now let's talk about the net change theorem. Before we go over this theorem um, and I read it to you, I want to go over a concept with you first so that the theorem makes sense. When we look at the graph of a function that represents some kind of rate, and so in this example, I'm going to use velocity. So we have the graph of the velocity. So velocity represents a rate and change, right? The change in distance over time. So when I look at the y-axis, this is going to represent um, distance per time. So let's just use um, feet per second as an example of Unix. And then down on the x-axis, we have the time, and we'll use seconds as our example. So if I look at some time t, we'll call it t1, and then over here I have t2. So these two represent some uh, time in seconds. If I look at the area under the graph between time 1 and time 2, so I'm looking at this area right here. If we imagine that we're finding our rectangles to approximate the area under the curve, I'm going to take the height of the rectangle, which the units of that would be feet per second, and then I'm going to multiply that by the width of the rectangle, which would be time in seconds. So when we find the area under the curve of a rate, specifically in this example, velocity, we're going to get feet, so we're going to get the distance. So what that area represents under the curve from T1 to T2 represents the change in distance from time one to time two. Now we have a formula to find out the exact distance traveled, because remember if that area represents the distance traveled from T1 to T2, and we're trying to find the area under the curve, really what we're doing is we're finding that integral from T1 to T2 of our velocity function. Now remember, when we integrate velocity, we're working backwards, so that will give us our position function evaluated from t1 to t2. Now if I plug in s of t2 and subtract s of t1, this is the change in distance. And this is going to be the net change, because this is going to take into consideration whether the velocity is negative or positive. And that's why we're calling this the net change. So for example, if I had a velocity function that was negative and positive, meaning the, the object was still moving but it changed direction. So let's say I had a velocity function that looked like this from t1 to T2. Then when I integrate, that's going to give me the net change because I have negative and positive area. If I want to find the total distance traveled, I would have to find, just like before, the absolute value of that function from T1 to T2 and integrate. 
So there's the net change, which takes into consideration a direction change. Or you can find or the total distance traveled by finding the absolute value of that velocity function and then integrating. So now, looking at the net change theorem, we have two equations here. This one we're familiar with. If we integrate a function, we get our capital F of B minus our capital F of A. But then we can rearrange that equation by adding capital F of A to both sides, and we can find the new value of a changing quantity by setting it equal to the initial value plus the integral, which is considered the rate of change. Now, depending on the application, we would use one of these equations. Um, you would just have to determine what's needed based on the now let's apply that idea of finding net displacement to this example. It says given a velocity function v of t is equal to 3t minus 5, and this is in meters per second, a particle in motion um, from time 0 to time 3, we're going to find the net displacement of the particle. So we're going to have to integrate from 0 to 3 of the velocity function, which is 3t minus 5 dt. Now, when I look at this, I notice that it's already simplified, so I can just go ahead and find the antiderivative. So I'm going to find the antiderivative of 3t first. So I have 3t squared over 2 minus 5t, and I need to evaluate that from 0 to 3. So first I'm going to plug in 3, so I get 3 times 3 squared over 2 minus 5 times 3, and then I need to subtract, I'm going to finish down here, because I'm running out of room, I'm going to subtract what I get when I evaluate it at 0. So I have 3 times 0 squared over 2 minus 5 times zero. Now this whole thing will give me zero and when I evaluate this expression here I'm going to get negative three halves. Now this is going to represent meters because this is the change in distance of that particle. Now if I draw a sketch of this graph 3t minus 5, it's going to look something like this. This is 3, this is 0. When I look at that shaded area between the x-axis and the curve, here's the shaded area that I just found. Now, the negative 3 halves just means that I moved more in the negative direction than I did in the positive direction. So, for example, if I moved forward 5 feet and then I backed up 7 feet, my net change in direction would be negative 2. But my total distance would be 12. So this just tells me I moved negative 1.5 meters more in the negative direction than in the positive direction. Now, for part B, we want to find the total distance travel, not the net. So when we look at the graph of 3t minus 5, we get a sketch that looks like this. We want to find the absolute value of that function. We want to find this. So if you notice, if we do a little algebra, we can find that 3t minus 5 is equal to 0 when t is 5 so this point right here is 5 thirds. So I know from 0 to 5 thirds, that's going to give me my negative area. And then from 5 thirds to 3, that's going to give me my positive area. So what I'm going to do is break this up into two integrals. I'm going to say, well, the total area is going to be from 5 thirds to 3 
of 3t minus 5. That gives me my positive area. But then I want to add the area that's below the x-axis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the area from 0 to 5 thirds on under the curve 3t minus 5. But because I know that this area is negative, I'm going to swap that out for a negative, make it a double negative so it becomes positive. So I'm negating the negative area to make it positive. So now I'm going to integrate 3t minus 5, and I'm going to do it on the interval from 5 thirds to 3. So if I take the antiderivative of 3t, that's going to give me 3t squared over 2 minus 5t when I take the antiderivative of that negative 5. I want to evaluate that from 5 thirds to 3. Then I'm going to subtract the negative area, which is going to make it positive. So I'm going to take 3t squared over 2 minus 5t and evaluate that from 0 to 5 thirds. So when I do that, I'll let you guys practice. Um, you should get 41 over 6 meters. So comparing this to part A, we said the net change in distance was negative 3 half meters, which means this particle moved more in the negative direction than in the positive direction, and by one and a half meters. If I added the total distance traveled and I didn't take into consideration which direction the particle was moving, the particle moved 41 divided by 6 meters, which if we want to approximate that, that would be about 6.83 meters. Okay, in this example, we're going to show how we can use the net change theorem and apply it to liquids as well. Um, so we're going to find how many gallons of gasoline is consumed over a time frame. And this is talking about a motorboat that starts at T equals zero hours. And the gas consumption can be modeled by the rate function, 5 minus T to the third over 100. This is definitely a rate function because it's showing how the gallons are consumed per hour. And the question asks, how much gasoline is used in the first hour? So we're going to find the amount of gasoline used. So if this is our function, just a general, a general look. If this is our function, we'll call it g of x for gasoline. The gas consumption is on the vertical axis, so that's gallons per hour. And then on the horizontal axis, we have the time in hours. So if I want to find the area under the curve from 0 to 2, I'm going to take the vertical unix, because think about um, finding the area under curve using rectangles. So I'm going to take gallons per hour, which would give me the height of the rectangles, and I would multiply by hours, and when I cross off hours, that will tell me how many gallons I use. So I'm going to integrate this from 0 to 2, 5 minus t to the third over 100 dt. This will tell me how much gas and gallons I've used in the first two hours, and then I can divide by 2 to estimate how much was used in the first hour. So when I find my antiderivative of each term, I'm going to have 5t minus t to the fourth over 400 because I get to divide by 4, and I already have 100 down there. So I have 100 times 4 is 400, and I want to evaluate that from 0 to 2. Since we're getting better and better at this, I'm going to let you evaluate that from 0 to 2. What you should get is 9.96 gallons, and then that would be how much was consumed over 0 to 2 hours. So if I divide that by 2, I'm going to get that we used approximately 4.98 gallons in the first hour. 
In the last topic, we're going to talk about a nice little shortcut that we could possibly use for integrating even in odd functions. And just a quick reminder, an even function is a function that's symmetric about the y-axis. So parabolas that have a vertex on the y-axis is a good example of an even function because it's symmetric across the y-axis. So if I folded that graph where the fold is on the y-axis, the graph would line up on both sides. Then for an odd function, odd functions are symmetric across the origin. So x to the third is a really good example of this. So I would switch the signs of both my x and y values. So if I have three, three on an odd function, then I would have the point negative three, negative three on that function as well. So just a quick reminder of what even and odd functions are. Now this shortcut tells us that if I integrate an even function, we're gonna look at this one first, instead of taking the interval from negative a to a, because it's symmetric along the y-axis, we can actually just take half of it and double it. So for example, if I was gonna use this example here of this parabola in pink, if I wanted to integrate from negative three to three, I want to find the area under the curve. Because the graph in pink is symmetric, it's an even function, it's symmetric across the y-axis, this area and this area have equal value. So really what I could do is just integrate one of these areas, we'll, call, we'll color this now in purple, and just double it. So that's what this is saying here. Now for odd functions, if I integrate from negative a to a, what's going to happen is I'm going to get zero because I'm going to use negative three and three again as my example. If I go from negative three to three and I want to find this shaded area, and this shaded area from negative three to three, because it's symmetric across the origin, this area here is gonna be equal to this area here. The only difference is that area two falls below the x-axis, so that's gonna be considered a negative area. So for example, I'm just making up a number here. Area one might be five, area two would be negative five. So when I add up those areas, what's going to happen is, for an odd function, it's going to be zero. Let's go ahead and apply this idea to integrating an even function. So we have 3x to the eighth minus 2. That's an even function, and the graph is going to look like this. It kind of looks like a quadratic, but it goes up a lot faster. So this y scale um, is going to be fairly big on a big scale compared to the x-axis. So if I want to find the area under the curve from negative 2 to positive 2, these two areas here and here, we'll call it area 1 and area 2, those are going to have equal area. So really what I can do is double the integral from 0 to 2 for the function 3x to the 8th minus 2. Now, I prefer using this method when I can only because when you use zeros for your limits rather than other numbers, it makes the arithmetic a lot easier. Other than that, there's not a huge difference in what you're doing, um, but 0 makes the arithmetic a lot easier. I am going to find the antiderivative of 3x to the 8th, which would be x to the 9th. Uh, let's see, if I take 3 divided by 9, I can then simplify that, and I'm going to write that as 1 -third. And then I'm going to subtract 2x, and I want to evaluate that from 0 to 2, and then double it. So when I plug in 2, 
I get 2 to the 9th over 3 minus 2 times 2. When I plug in 0, that just gives me 0, so I don't have to worry about that. So I'm going to double whatever I get inside these brackets. So inside the brackets, I'm going to get 500 over 3. When I double that, I'm going to get 1,000 over 3. So this is my area under the curve from negative 2 to 2. Area 1 and area 2 separately have the area of 500 over 3. Now you can verify this if you actually want to find the integral from negative 2 to 2. And you'll find that if you do that without doubling it and you just go that whole distance from negative 2 to 2, you'll still get the same answer, 1,000 over 3. Now let's do the same thing, but we're going to apply this to an odd function. So we have negative 5 sine x. That's definitely an odd function. It will look like this. Sine looks like this. It's a wave, but then we've got to stretch it out to 5 and negative 5 for that amplitude. And then the negative tells me to take the reflection over the x-axis. So this is the graph we end up with. Now if I look at this from negative pi to pi, I have negative pi here, and then I have pi here. This area here is going to be equivalent to this area here, other than the fact that one's below and one's above the x-axis. So without doing any work, I know that I can say that the integral from minus pi to pi of negative 5 sine x dx is going to be equal to 0. Now, if you want to go through the motions and actually find the integral and do the work, you will find that that integral is equal to 0, um, and that would be a great practice exercise for you.